Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this short game to the video, we're going to be discussing three pieces of tech news which have popped up over the past 24 or so hours. As regular viewers know, I tend to do things alphabetically, but this video is going to be the exception to that rule because there are a couple of smaller pieces that we can get into and then a more analytical piece. So NVIDIA are not going to be utilizing HBM2 for consumer level cards, supposedly. We have some benchmarks and specifications of AMD's Threadripper lineup of CPUs, specifically the 16 core derivatives. And then finally, we can move into Intel's X299 platform and some more information that's popped up on that. But before we jump into it, I just want to give a quick shout out to Joe. Yulaz and Tommy, who have messaged me these news stories. There are a couple of others as well, but they have wished to remain anonymous. And also, another small digression, I have been less than active over the past couple of days because I've just been really busy with uh, real life stuff. So Amy's, of course, been doing a lot of stuff for E3 anyway, so it's good to not flood the channel too much. And as an aside, yesterday I was out doing some filming which it should be on the channel actually pretty soon. It's a very different type of event, and you'll know what I what I mean when you see it. I can't disclose too much information at the moment because I'm under some NDAs, but it's nothing bad or anything sponsored. It's just kind of a cool event that we got invited to, and I figured it would be kind of fun to cover. But with all of that said, let's jump into this, shall we? So a website by the name of Fudzilla has been discussing HBM2 and specifically NVIDIA and not utilizing it. Yes, I know that NVIDIA are not exactly shy when it comes to HBM2. They have used high bandwidth memory before, but according to their sources, they will not be using GeForce and HBM2 memory. The reasoning behind this is because it's, quote, too early, and HBM2 is just too expensive, perhaps prohibitively so for consumer-level parts. So what does that mean for us? Well, Pretty simple. It is, of course, GDDR5X, possibly GDDR6 for some future GPUs, but because R6 is not going to release until some point next year, it's most likely if we do see Volta this year, it's going to be using R, uh, R5X, and this is possibly even true for the early part of next year as well. Let's assume, however, we do get a Volta, um, you know, 2080 tie or whatever it's going to end up being called then possibly we might see r6 on that so according to fudzilla once again and i'll read out a verbatim quote volta is out for artificial intelligence machine learning applications it will be shipping in the dgx1 systems by the way as an aside we did cover this on NVIDIA's own conference, but anyway, jumping back into the quote, mainly for deep learning and AI. The new GeForce will be a completely separate chip, end quote. So basically what they're saying here, according to their sources anyway, is that the average person just cannot afford or does not need this level of performance. It's hard to dispute. There are certainly advantages of R5X or R6, and I don't really want to turn this whole video into a massive debate. HBM2 has certainly advantages. It has a much smaller form factor required. It doesn't require so much power consumption. Uh, it doesn't need so much power consumption, rather it puts out less heat. The size of the actual GPU itself can be considerably smaller. For example, see the Fury Nanos. And there is, I believe, less latency. In terms of memory bandwidth, it really does depend on A, the um, traditional memory it's being put up against, as well as you know, bus width. So, for example, if we were to take a look at a lot of the uh, Vega stuff that right now, it's not, it's about 500 gigabytes per second of memory bandwidth, which obviously is not exactly difficult for R5X or even R6 to hit if it has a wide enough bus width. Unfortunately, that also increases the cost of the GPU itself, increases the power consumption, and finally, it also means it's more difficult to actually design. So there are definitely benefits and uh, pitfalls for both GPU architectures. So whether this is true or not, well, obviously it is only one source and we don't know how accurate their information is. So, you know, as usual, pinch of salt. Now let's move over to Threadripper. So there is a couple of Threadripper pieces. The first is just kind of more of a PSA. So... There was a rumour that was being shunted around the internet thanks to a new story which popped up on PCWorld.com. Now, the original story 
was not exactly abundantly clear. So I'm just putting this out there because I've already had a couple of messages regarding this. And basically, what the claim was is that Fred Ripper would essentially be exclusive to Alienware, which of course is now owned by Dell. So in other words, if you were, let's say, to try to go to Amazon or whomever, or even to just buy something from HP or even your local uh, you know, store, you'd be basically screwed because Fred Ripper would be given exclusively to Alienware. But this is not the case. Basically, they have exclusivity, for now anyway, regarding Fred Ripper, and it will remain so until the end of the year, but this is only for big name PC rivals. So in other words, if you want to buy something from, say, Lenovo, and you want a Fred Ripper, you're shit out of luck. You can't do that. But if you're wanting to buy it for your own uses, let's say, once again, you're going to, like, you know, Dabs or uh, Amazon or whatever, and you want to buy that chip, that's absolutely fine. You should be able to do that. Similarly, if you're a smaller OEM designer, let's say you know you own a small web, you own a small business, and you want to put these things together for customers, perhaps in limited quantities, maybe for overclocking purposes or whatever, then you also should be able to do that as well. Personally, I don't like exclusivity uh, deals. Rather, I don't like it because. At the end of the day, yes, most folks listening to this or watching this, depending on what, how you're doing it, are definitely going to be probably, that was the worst sentence in the history of humanity, but you're most likely going to be wanting to build your own, or at least know a friend which is going to build your own system. But that's not the general public. And let's say for the sake of argument that you have a business, uh, let's say doing 3D rendering or video editing, and let's face it, that's one of the purposes of high-end desktops, especially for like 16 cores or whatever, then you probably don't want to build like 20 PCs or how many other desktops you're going to need to, you know, handle the workloads of your employees. You're just going to want to kind of just build build, build these things um, and, oh, sorry, have these things built for you, ready-made. So in which case, this does limit your options a little bit. It is what it is, however. Speaking of Threadripper, specifications and performance have supposedly leaked out of the, onto the internet. Now, this is for one specific model of Threadripper, the 1950X, which, just to clarify, is a 16-core 32-thread derivative. We're unsure if this represents the very top-end CPU or, you know, just the one below it. Now, these benchmarks have popped up onto... Primate Labs, who you may also recognize as the folks behind Geekbench. Now, I'm not going to tell you that this is legit, and I'm not going to tell you how genuine it is, because quite frankly, there's a lot of ambiguity here, so by the time this video goes out, it may have been completely debunked. So here's basically the synopsis, at least as far as I understand it, as it's developing. This benchmark popped out, and it was a genuine entry on to the Geekbench um, ent uh, database. But there were certainly some questions regarding the score, multi-CPU score. It was scoring 24,539, which is definitely possible. You know, the fact that perhaps not the, the CPU isn't running 100%. There were issues with, let's say, the BIOS or drivers or whatever. And in other words, it was more of a test case rather than a final revision silicon or, you know, something that you're going to be seeing on your store shelves tomorrow. After all, let's just be totally honest, they're not formally released right now. But things become a bit weird, and from what we can tell, the system was not using quad-channel memory. Now, whether that's a bug, whether that's an error, perhaps there was only two sticks of RAM installed in the motherboard, perhaps uh, Geekbench wasn't detecting it properly, perhaps there was an issue with the BIOS, perhaps Windows was being hinky or something else, we don't know. And the second thing is the chipset was almost looking like it was a B350. Now, once again, whether that's because um, Geekbench wasn't detecting it properly, perhaps whether it was a driver issue, BIOS, we don't know. Another thing, other than the results looking just a little bit lower than what you'd expect, it's kind of weird because supposedly uh, WCCF Tech, who originally spotted this, actually got a request from ASRock to remove their name in reference to this particular entry in their article. 
I think you can read most of the stuff on screen, so I'm not going to read out how much cash it's got and other bits and bobs, because quite frankly, most of that is stuff we've already known anyway, or could kind of guess based upon the rise in architecture. My personal opinion is that we don't know enough, and because the entries disappeared and we don't have enough other entries to really know whether it's genuine or not, I would personally, personally view it sceptically, but not 100% it's fake, because ultimately we just don't know. I've seen really weird, and I'm pretty sure most of you have as well, you've seen weird errors where software just doesn't detect something correctly and it's popping up with something weird and it's not, you know, registering the number of cores or the clock speed or the amount of cash or the, the you know, BIOS revision or whatever, and it's just not quite reading correctly. I remember even back in the days of like when HBM2, first, sorry, HBM first came out, there was like issues with that. So whether it's a case of that or whether it really was fake or whatever, I don't know. The only reason I'm thinking it might not be fake, and once again, we have no, you know, kind of, uh, we have no knowledge whether it is or not, is because it's now removed. And also, ASRock asked them, supposedly, obviously we don't have their word for it, to remove their name in the article. But then again, you can quite clearly see it's ASRock X399 Professional Gaming Motherboard anyway. So whether that's true or not, well, I'll leave it down to your interpretation. Finally, let's talk about Intel, shall we? And the X299 platform. Also known as Skylake X and Kabylink X. So this is probably about the most controversial topic that I'm covering at the moment. Some people absolutely seem to love Skylake X and KB Lake X, and especially the Skylake X, not so much KB Lake to be fair, but Skylake X definitely does have its fans. Other people really feel that Intel are ripping them off because of pricing or what have you, which, you know, is a fair enough reasoning uh, that they are very expensive chips, I will grant you. Regardless, there was a rumour that was going about around a week ago that told us that some of the chips, specifically the 18-core derivatives especially, were having major manufacturing issues, and basically Intel just pretty much just announced them for an announcement. And therefore, the chips were going to be released at 2018 Q1. Unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on your perspective, whether you're for or against this platform, this is not the case. As Intel have finally confirmed the launch dates for the various processors. What we have here definitely is a staggered launch. So we have June 26th for the 7640, the 7740, the 7800, the 7820, and finally the 7900, all of course ending in X, uh, chips. So a little bit later, in August, we have the 7920X, which is a 12-core chip, and finally the 14, 16, and 18-core chips, ending, of course, in, once again, the 7980XE, is going to hit October. Unfortunately, there are no further information, there's no further information, excuse me, regarding the clock speeds of these particular chips, which probably does mean that Intel are still fine-tuning the CPUs to figure out what they can realistically get out of them. Do you remember there is an awful lot of computing performance just on a very small die size, so ultimately heat, power consumption, and all of that stuff does definitely play a role. It was only about a week or so ago that there was another rumour from bitsandchips.it that Intel were possibly going to be working on a version 2 of Socket 2066. For those who do not know, tw Socket 2066 is, of course, the X299's socket. Now, that's the thing that you plug the CPU into. The reason behind this was because the platform wasn't originally designed for chips above, let's say, 14, 16 cores. Therefore, there were power consumption issues, and therefore, there was a possibility that they might not be able to basically deliver the clock speeds that perhaps customers would be expecting. And that was actually one of the reasons for the delay and not manufacturing issues. Whether any of this stuff is true, whether we will actually see a version 2 of the socket possibly with better clock speeds in the future, unfortunately, as usual, all we can do is wait. It's kind of weird, though, uh, in terms of computing right now. And I have to say, 
if you are thinking of buying a Threadripper, if you're thinking of buying a, a Skylake X chip, or even any GPU, it's a really weird time in the industry. And I know I've said this a couple of times in the past, but it's getting even crazier. So I'm kind of looking forward to it because even when Vega gets released from, of course, AMD, it's like, what are NVIDIA going to do? Are they going to be happy to just kind of wait it out for the rest of the year? Are they going to perhaps release Volta almost instantaneously on the, in, you know, on the GeForce side of things? Are we going to see, you know, the, like the 2080 just a couple, emerge like three or four weeks after uh, Vega? Is it going to be, a, a you know, a half a year later? Who the hell knows? It's just a bit crazy. Anyway, hopefully you've enjoyed the video. I'll see you soon. Take care of yourselves. Bye for now.